I invite everybody to do is go to the word cloud now, though, however, please. And hopefully, in your discussions now, you have come up with some words that would help you think of ways to answer this question. And the question is, what words would you describe the most common impediments that prevent parties from resolving their commercial disputes? So out of all the collections, whether it's easy to change, difficult to change, or impossible to change, what are the words that you would use to describe the most common impediments that keep the parties from resolving their commercial disputes? And we see already that we have some answers. I wonder whether luck is related to a chair. <laughs> I get blamed for everything. <laughs> exactly. Okay, I do. Relationships. May I? Please. Many thanks. Uh, let me firstly. Just a few words to, to thank the organizers of the Global Pound Conference, the, the, in particular the Chamber of Commerce uh, of Florence, uh, for inviting me to this very, very meaningful meeting. Very interesting. Uh, and I already learned, I think, to have learned, and I hope to have learned just too much, certainly more than I expected to learn. At this point, this uh, session is, uh, for me, particularly interesting because it involves many crucial points of this discussion. And uh, I would like just to um, say something, some very short comments uh, be before giving the floor to my distinguished colleagues. <clears throat> just to say that one of the, the words I saw, the relationships, uh, is a key word in this, uh, in this session in my opinion, obviously, because it involves uh, many aspects, and in particular, the relationships between ADR, adjudicative tools, and uh, judicial system. It involves technology in the sense of the future of justice. It, it involves uh, relationships between lawyers and judges, between uh, providers and people. So, Many, many, many things. It's a very, very important word, meaningful and significant. But I would say that uh, in that sense, the relationships between uh, ADR, not only mediation, but because uh, we are talking about ADR, that is something that is not, uh, not only mediation, you know, arbitration, mediation, and other, and other mechanisms. I would say, I would say that uh, starting from this point, uh, we generally, and we generally spoke and speak about uh, ADR as an alternative this, to the judicial system, judicial adjudication. But even during this morning and uh, through this, the discussions we had, uh, it's clear at the moment that we are moving, possibly, from uh, an uh, alternative dispute resolution, possibly to an integrated uh, dispute resolution. And this is an issue 
I think is a very important to explore for us, uh, really referring to all the aspects we are talking about. So I will give the floor to Bea to discuss uh, about uh, uh, the, the first question, uh, and um, that is uh, really meaningful in, in, in terms of uh, even of uh, answers. It's not working. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. So thank you very much. So um, I will give the insight from the house lawyer. So maybe I, I, the first thing is I don't agree in the sense that for me it's not the first one the insufficient knowledge of options. Uh, maybe I would say that for some particular agreements that maybe were signed a long time ago, it's difficult to find the uh, multi-tier uh, clause. So it's difficult to agree on a later stage to have this pre uh, uh, escalation. I would say that the first one for the in-house lawyer would be maybe financial, and it's quite obvious. So I will comment and give you some consideration regarding maybe the, the other, that for us as uh, in-house uh, lawyer, it's, it's important because one obstacle that we found is that, uh, uh, we find is that uh, if the other country party is, uh, for instance, uh, a government and a state, they don't want to resolve the matter. They don't want to, to take the responsibility of doing anything. So they want to fight until the end. And uh, even if it will be a, a negative outcome, it's better that to, to assume uh, and to, take a, 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 to make a decision. Uh, so uh, for me, it would be an important obstacle. Maybe the second one, uh, the emotion. The emotional. Uh, during this morning, someone told, told about that uh, and talk, uh, saying that, uh, yeah. I completely agree, but I think there are two stages in which I think the motion is, is really an obstacle. Since the beginning, because normally the problem, not creating the conflict, but participating in the conflict, they don't want to resolve it. And maybe in a second step, the people participating in the litigation itself, because at the end of the day, they think that they will win. And uh, they don't want to take, again, the decision of uh, uh, resolve the matter before. So uh, for, for me, it will be the, the m m most important one. OK. Do you have any comments? Yes, I just wanted to add, uh, although I'm a representing influencer, so I shouldn't be speaking about that, but we should notice that there is a huge difference between answers, what parties' answers would be the main, is the main obstacle, financial constraints, and then advisors place it on the fourth place. That's pretty uh, big difference, I would say, and this can also be potential room for improvement for the future. Yeah. I know, I know please, this is, uh, please. Uh, against, uh, GPC public policy, but my answer would be it depends. Uh, it depends which parties we are we are actually talking about, because here we have GE, we have NL, but are we talking about these sophisticated parties or completely unsophisticated parties? I think. Yeah. International dispute resolution involves uh, both, and the answers may be completely different. I can see emotional, cultural obstacles as very relevant to unsophisticated parties, probably not to more sophisticated parties with share uh, a common uh, approach uh, to, to, uh, to dispute resolution. Um, for me, uncertainty is extremely important, precisely because it's important uh, across the board in, in all, each and every case. I can share an experience, which is my current involvement in an investment arbitration, which is uh, one of a series of three identical cases in which there are different lawyers representing the parties and different arbitral tribunals in the three cases, with the risk of three completely different uh, outcomes. And this, of course, I mean, uh, uncertainty and predictability has to do with transparency, with uh, equal access to, to information, which I think is something that can be improved. So you, <clears throat> you are saying that even for arbitration, there is something that we have uh, to explore in uh, understanding better the advantages and disadvantages uh, in comparison with judicial system. I think it, it, it covers all uh, dispute resolution techniques we are talking about. It involves litigation because um, the uncertainty of having to go and litigate before courts in an international setting, foreign courts, it can be arbitration because precisely, the, for example, the selection of the adjudicators 
Uh, and it can be also mediation where parties may go through the process having the feeling that they are uh, giving up something. Uh, okay. Colin, would you add that something? No, I want to do the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Please, w may we go to the second one? When, whatever Colin wants. To improve... <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep it and move it. <laughs> <laughs> to improve the future of commercial dispute resolution. So the first thing I want to say is processes. I'd like to compliment the organizers on their use of this technology. I think this is very impressive. I had no idea we were going to be so wired today, and I thought <laughs> the technology has worked, aside from a couple Wi-Fi connections, which is not Jeremy's fault. I think this is amazing, so kudos to all of you. But I'd like to begin with, oh yeah, please, a round of applause. <laughs> Anytime we can get applause for technology, I'm happy. But, uh, <laughs> scroll down to the bottom here. Look at what's at the bottom. No, no, scroll up a little bit, sorry. Number one, adjudicative dispute resolution methods, 6%. So the question here is, what is the future? What's going to improve the future of commercial dispute resolution? And people put adjudicative dispute resolution at the bottom. I think that's very interesting, because I think there is a sense that we've sort of squeezed all the juice out of this particular orange. Now, where is the enthusiasm? If you go back up to the top, um, it looks like non-adjudicative pr procedures. People are much more interested. They feel like that represents the future of commercial dispute resolution. And you can see that's number two. I also em embrace uh, the winner here, pre-dispute or pre-escalation processes. I feel like we have not done enough to innovate at these, the, the, the systems we have in place prior to negotiation taking place. Now, I, I have a particular hobby horse here with technology that I think dives into this, but it's intriguing to me that the parties are saying number two, the uh, non-adjudicative non dispute resolution methods, but the providers are very interested in pre-dispute. And I think that means we need to work earlier up the chain to get access to disputes before they escalate to educate parties. Uh, I also think um, number three is interesting. The judges picked number three as their number one. Of course, the judges are going to think that in their <laughs> encouragement is the number one. You can see there, adjudicative providers say the number one is encouragement by courts. Um, but I also think you can look at the blues there, the number twos for adjudicative providers, non-adjudicative providers. That is the combination, which in the US we call that meat arb. But if you look at it through the eyes of the parties, they don't really understand negotiation, mediation, arbitration, conciliation, all of these different techniques can be confusing to them. What they really want is a simple process that goes from front to back, it has cost efficiency, and you can have one neutral that comes in and provides that, so that's very interesting. But the main thing that I wanna, I wanna disagree with is the purple, technology. <laughs> It is very interesting to me that technology was so low on the list of all of the different categories. And I will say to you, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're wrong, and I think the reason why, now I'm coming from Silicon Valley, so I'm hopelessly biased. So take this with a grain of salt. But what we say in Silicon Valley is software is going to eat the world. Software has already eaten medicine. It has already eaten entertainment. It has already eaten finance. And let me tell you something, software is going to eat all of this. It's going to eat the law, and it's going to eat dispute resolution. All of the things we're talking about in terms of transparency, in terms of accessibility, in terms of cost effectiveness, technology improves all of these things. And I was talking with my friend Leo. I think Europe, and maybe, maybe Italy in particular, is behind the curve in terms of the rest of the world with what's happening. But all of you are emailing with your parties. All of you are using tools. You're using Skype, you're using Word, you're using all of these different things. Eventually, that is gonna completely transform all of this, and I believe in five years, the technology will be at the top. Colin, we are all scared about yes. what you just yeah. said. <laughs> we thought that technology was something good because it was something A to contents, the law, and now we, we realize that it replaces the law. Well, I would, like, I would say if you resist it, that will end in tears. We but if you scared. embrace it, this can be a massive opportunity. Much like the bar associations were frightened of dispute resolution until it came, and then they realized, okay, this isn't the end of me, this is a new opportunity. Technology is the same. And the people that say, I'm never going to use technology, I'm going to fight it, that's not going to work out very well for you if you look at other industries. But if you say what opportunities exist when I utilize these tools, look at Jeremy. We never could have done this. 
All of these calculations 10 years ago would have taken a team of 100 people three weeks, and now we're doing it instantly. So that's all right. Embrace Call the future. <laughs> Colin. Uh, yes. Colin. <laughs> <laughs> I am here from the future, that's right. Without coming to moving to the fantasy, just uh, <laughs> staying in reality, as I, as I think we are sure. uh, talking about the things you are talking about, right? Uh, not fantasy. Do you think that the, the use of technology as uh, proposed in some recent reform, uh, as you, we discussed before, mm -hmm. for the online course, for example, mm -hmm. Uh, may change the structure in itself of a civil litigation, even in the civil course, uh, I mean, uh, and uh, even reversing the importance and the range of the ordinary stages of, of a civil litigation. Absolutely. And we were talking about this earlier, Marcelo. There are courts that are looking to build online-only courts where parties do not have to show up in person. They do not have to have, to have a lawyer. They're doing this in Canada. They're doing this in the UK. That's eventually going to be coming to Italy and other areas in Europe. It's going to completely it's transform the way we think about litigation. It will expand access to justice. It will reduce costs. And it will reduce time to resolution. So we need to think about how do we get ahead of that and embrace these changes to provide better dispute resolution services as opposed to just letting it create chaos? So a I strong think, connection between technology, increasing of technology, and ADR using. That's right. But here also, may, sorry, may I just okay. add up, uh, one point? I think uh, where the role of influencer and educator is, is exactly there in technology. I wish I had this application and uh, that I, we have all today in my class because finally students will listen to me perhaps and maybe <laughs> will get more engaged. But I think this is more and more important to teach students also in the context of pre-dispute and pre-escalation processes. Look at what influencers responded that yeah. this ranks first. So I think that what is also important is education as early as possible in relation to new technologies, but also uh, putting emphasis on transferable skills of conflict management and resolution, early resolution. And mm -hmm. if we could combine these together, that would be ideal. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to contribute a little bit at least. <laughs> Any further comment? No, I had just... Um, uh, I was not surprised by the encouragement by courts, which made uh, mediation explode in, in Florence because the tribunals, they started to order mediation, so everybody started to go to mediation. But my guess is that you needed an order just because you didn't have education. Because um, uh, lawyers, judges, parties, they have not been educated to this kind of method. So, my guess is that the most influential tool for, to improve ADR is education. Mm -hmm. Once you get the law students coming out of law schools, knowing about all these uh, new methods, they will be, I think, the, the most important uh, drivers of, yes, yes. of the yeah. mm -hmm. passage. So it's not, it's not on the... I agree completely with yeah. you. And in front of me, I see Nicola Giudice, a good friend of mine, we worked together in Milan just, and we were convinced from the very beginning of this process that the role of course is decisive, as lawyers' role is decisive. Without them, it's impossible to yeah. have a, a proper and an efficient system yeah. and, and of ADR. We, I think we cover partly the third, yeah. the, the third point, the we third question. Some people in the audience would like to have Thank you, Isabel Uto again. I would like to react upon your um, optimism about technology, even if theoretically um, I totally agree with you. I think that uh, in technology all depends on whom, who is using it and uh, with what purpose. And up to now, I have um, a great regret to say, that um, it has technology, this same technology, has turned the US litigation into true nightmares. Hmm. Nightmares not only so costly, but really now missing the very goal of the litigation, which is to come to a you know, normal solution, to a normal problem. We have experienced that many times, 
So, um, you know, I, I cannot share your optimism again. And I'm even surprised that those kind of things can happen in the United States. And even for, I have one example, a precise example in mind, which is very close to Silicon Valley because it's in San Francisco. Mm. And I have to say that it's, it's beyond any explanation. With all the tentative mediation failing, thanks to the American system again. So I would like to share your optimism, but you know, you have to really shape it. Absolutely, and let me just say, I, I don't want to come off as promoting this change. I think there are pluses to this change and there are minuses to this change. But I am going to tell you that this change is inevitable. Mm. So I think that we need to make sure that we can try and control this dynamic to preserve the aspects of the litigation and dispute resolution processes that we value. There is a lot of chaos that comes when, when technology is deployed. But I will tell you, and this is a provocative thing to say, this is the courthouse of the future. This phone is how the vast majority of people are going to get redress, low dollar value, high volume cases. In the United States, we have a crisis of self-represented pro se litigants who cannot afford lawyers and who do not go to the courts. How can we provide services to them when the courts are being cut, 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 money is being brought out of the courts? So I agree with you. If we could go back to the way the system worked before, there was a lot of good things about that that we are losing because of technology. But unfortunately, I think the genie is out of the bottle. And we need to be inventive. We need to embrace the future. So um, I, I agree with your concerns. I don't have an easy answer for them, but I think we need to be realistic about what's happening. Can I make a quick comment, not on this point, but on the adjudicative, non-adjudicative tools, because I think this, this, this is important. I think it is a truism to say that we all prefer non-adjudicative uh, processes. The problem is how you, 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 you resolve the dispute with, through non-adjudicative tools. And there, I think, and I was a bit surprised by the fact that uh, adjudicative tools uh, rank uh, last here, uh, because having something that hits hard in the background forces you to try to find solutions before getting there. Yeah. Yes. That's why I'm surprised by this, and I'm not surprised by the fact that combining adjudicative and non-adjudicative tools is ranks mm -hmm. quite, yeah. quite higher. Yeah, I completely agree. This is a point I completely agree. You already covered. Please. Please. Uh, Okay. Any question? Yes. One, one, one consideration and one question. Could you question. introduce yourself, yes. please? Yes. Mm, I'm Michele Capecchi. I'm an attorney here in Florence. Um, one consideration is um, I think that most of the, con the consideration that we're doing so far are very valuable as, as long as we're talking about business to business. But when we're dealing with, as it happens very often in situations like in an environment like the Italian and a small environment as it is like the one that we have not only in Florence but in Italy in general, it happens very often that there is one side that is, as the, other, the Mr. Miss um, Saint Marty said, that doesn't really have an interest yeah. in, in getting to resolving quickly. And this is related to the fact that it is one of the basic principle of uh, alternative dispute resolution that is that alternative dispute resolution works well when the judiciary system works well. Because if it fails, like if uh, going in arbitration or mediation is just an alternate, does, doesn't have on the other side a judiciary system that works well, we don't really have an alternative. What is the, the, the incentive for a person to mediate when he knows that he's wrong, and he knows that if he goes in, in court, he's going to gain at least four, five, six, ten years of time, and then who knows what's going to happen then. So I think it's very important to take in consideration, especially in business to consumers, dispute the fact that we need a better, probably, judiciary system in order to improve the, the quality and the access also to uh, alternative dispute resolution uh, proceedings and alternatives. This is as a general statement and consideration. As a for a question, I was wondering if, from international mediation point of view, um, trying to uh, uh, include uh, ways to have a more easy uh, international enforceability of, on an award and an agreement that, has re that is reached on, uh, through mediation can be a way to incentivate the mediation proceeding uh, on international issues. Maybe I can answer to the second one. We will cover that on our, okay. uh, I think it's the third of the four ones. 
And the, the first consideration, what I can say is that it depends. The first of, is not that the maybe, I, I'm not referring to the Italian system only, but in some cases, because normally Enel is investing worldwide, so maybe uh, uh, the, the part of our investment here in Italy is quite now uh, yes. small. But uh, it is not only a matter that they, they don't work well. So is it a matter that you don't know? So for us, international arbitration means that we, we know when we will fight, and maybe it will be or not, and uh, after 10 years or even more, uh, we will know the system, and we will know the, the, we will know the law. So it, for us, I share with you, but it's not only depending on the, how the system is working. It's in the, we don't know the system when we invest there. Question three now, I believe. Question three. I think uh, we, we already covered partly question three because uh, yes, this we is, discuss. <laughs> yeah, this is actually maybe we can comment. I can comment if you want, but it's more or less just that. Don't you think we already covered yeah. that? We can pass to the, to the fourth because we can. Just, just one brief comment. Yes. Uh, uh, I, would I, I would very much like... Uh, accreditation or certification system for uh, providers, but I find it very hard to just to uh, write down some rules or what, what, how do you evaluate uh, a, 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 a alternative dispute resolution provider? It's very hard to, to write down some rules or some or, or I'm asking to the, to the public, do you have some suggestions? Because I would like to hear something about that. Rules, yes, some standards. Some, because you know, you, you, the, the mediation procedures are very private. You have ethic rules of conduct for mediators, but once you are in the room, yeah, nobody can check on what you are doing. And this has been a big challenge in the yeah. United States for two decades to try and come up with enforceable certification standards. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Isn't IMI working on some of that, yeah. Jeremy? He's a private the person body. to maybe ask is Michael, who's also on yeah. the board of IMI. Michael, Michael yeah. if you want to. IMI, for those, those who do not know, IMI is actually the organization that had the idea for the Global Pound Conference, is it, is it, it, does, is, it um, celebrates its 10th year anniversary this year. When it was founded in 2007, it's, the IMI stands for the International Mediation Institute. Um, and this, I, this a little bit, actually, I think, goes to where Colin was going about change and change being inevitable. When IMI was founded in 2007, we faced enormous resistance from around the world in the mediation community because IMI's objective was to promote standards and to say, if you want to be a mediator, you should be able to meet certain minimum competency requirements. There should be quality because if you force people into mediation before you have a service, that it provides a certain level of quality, then you risk also killing that service because people will say, I won't use it because it doesn't work. The problem isn't with the process. The problem is with the people who don't have adequate training and understanding of the process. So IMI said, we need to promote standards. And then once we promote standards, we will also provide certification of those who achieve what we would call a gold standard. Not everybody, but if you achieve a very high level of competency, we have Jeremy is an IMI certified mediator. Giovanni De Berti is an IMI certified mediator. It's not easy to do because you have to, you obtain that also by working with feedback from parties who have mediated your disputes. But today, IMI is no longer controversial. IMI now certifies, it doesn't certify mediators itself, institutions that meet IMI's standards. It's like ISO, right? It's a standard. You meet the standard, we say you've met the standards. So there are institutions today that train mediators to meet the IMI standards, and they can now claim that they are IMI certified. 
So it's no longer what we're seeing, if anything, today, and we actually have a request here in Colin, to maybe just to speak on behalf of Italy, we received a request from Mauro Rubino Samartano, who is a lawyer and very active in arbitration and mediation in Milan, who is proposing to do something similar in the arbitration world. Say, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you from a party's perspective, you know, when you look around, it used to be when I started doing in, in conflicts for my company in 1999, sorry to speak to close very quickly, in 1999, there was a very small group of people who were very well-known international arbitrators. It was not hard to know who you needed to appoint. Today, the world is much more distributed. Um, there's still the same famous people, but there's so many more disputes going on. So when we name arbitrators, we are very often finding ourselves nominating people we have no experience with. We don't know if they're very good, and we have very bad experiences because we base them on what we heard from Barbara, from Andrea, but they may have had one experience. It's an anecdote. It's not necessarily representative of how they are going to act in our arbitration. So I think there's going to be eventually, we'll see in this area, you know, a movement it may not happen next year. I think this, all things have their time. But if you think about it in terms of professionalization, right? Who would go to a doctor that did not have a medical degree, a medical degree, and a license to practice medicine, right? You think, well, that's absurd. Of course, if I go to a doctor, I want the doctor to have a medical license. If I go to a lawyer, I want the lawyer to, of course, have passed the bar exam and to be licensed to practice law. But yet we appoint arbitrators and mediators without ever asking these fundamental questions. It works in a small world because everybody knows everybody, but in a very big, complex world, it probably we will see, I, I, I predict that it's a question of, of, of time. You, it's like, it's inevitable. We will get there in arbitration as we have with mediation and in ODR and all the other things because the market will demand these levels of, of competency. So quick, quick point of view from an IMI perspective and where we're going now. Let me add uh, <clears throat> just a, a very short remark about this point related to this point. That is the possibility for a court to choose mediator, not only arbitrator for parties, but even mediator. This is very controversial and it was uh, already discussed, at exam for example, in Italy. And there are uh, European countries where courts may do it. In Italy, not. And uh, I think that uh, the choosing of the mediator may improve and increase the quality of mediators and the even reputation of mediation as uh, successful. But unfortunately, there are people uh, against it because uh, of the conflict of interests and uh, because the impartiality of the, of, of the course. So, can I make a quick comment on this? And this will be the only moment today that I will wear my um, former uh, ICC hat, or not ICC, but institutional uh, hat, to say that I'm not sure that this is what courts were created for, uh, appointing arbitrators or mediators. Well, there are institutions that have been created precisely to do this and have developed over the years and the decades a specific know-how about how to select a dispute. Uh, uh, adjudicator, obviously, or obviously. so I, I, I wouldn't reinvent uh, the wheel here, and I, I'm not for institutions appointing all arbitrators or all mediators acting in their cases. I'm very much in favor of giving the parties a full opportunity to do the appointment themselves. I think institutions would be in troubles had they to select all arbitrators, and will certainly not expand the pool, but really limit it to the, the, the usual um, uh, suspects. But I think uh, uh, in, in, as in addition to party autonomy and the, the, the possibility of selecting the mediator, the uh, arbitrator, uh, I think its institutions are, are precisely there for, for that. I think I, I'm, uh, I completely agree with you because I think it's a, it's a known problem, in fact, because once we will have uh, uh, bodies uh, assuring the quality, at least the average quality of people uh, doing that, uh, there, will, there will be no need to appoint, <laughs> no request to appoint. Uh, obviously, there is a demand of it because uh, not always we have this uh, requirement in the appointment uh, of uh, 
mediators and arbitrators. Can I just have a quick question to Andrea? Or we don't have time? I don't know, I'm just up to you. Please, uh, please, I, I think uh, we will have, uh, we are finishing our time and we are uh, we using all the time. two more questions to do, that's all. So I can kind of combine it as introduction to question number four because I wanted to follow up on what Mike mentioned. We can pass to the, to the, to the yeah. question number four, please. Yes, so uh, regarding question number four, we also see that the external lawyers are the most hesitant to change, and I believe adjudicative providers as well, which would be members of institutions, I assume. But then if we look back into the previous question, most respondents mentioned that we should have convention on mediation, so we should have more legal instruments adopted instead, actually, of these uh, accreditation schemes, which are very much in, uh, of self-regulatory uh, character. So my question also to Andrea, if I may ask, following uh, on the previous conversation, was what is the uh, idea of the institutions regarding codes of ethics, of codes of conduct, whether this is completely forgotten or whether we can still shift the discussion in regarding the change into a very self-regulatory mechanisms that the providers or arbitrators can uh, adopt instead of, again, looking into legal mechanisms, because I'm not necessarily sure this is what this resolution world wants to have. No, I think this is definitely a role that institutions are increasingly uh, taking upon themselves in different ways, different uh, in institutions. It may be more difficult for certain institutions, uh, for, the, for example, the ICC being truly international, it's certainly difficult to find the same ethical standards applicable to arbitrators or a parties council coming from literally all parts of the world. It may be easier for institutions that have a more uh, local or, or regional focus where there is more uniformity of, uh, of approaches. But I think this is uh, definitely, I mean, I, I, I mentioned the selection of the uh, adjudicators. Certainly setting rules uh, to, in a way, level the playing field is, uh, is, 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 a, is a role that institutions uh, are taking and, uh, and increasingly and should take um, even more in the future, I think. So we can... Um if there's no remark about the fourth, uh, we can pass to the fifth. Is this the fifth? The fifth um, about the stakeholder more influent in, uh, pro in improving and in uh, making the change in the re ADR resolution. Do you have any any remark on it, uh, Laura? I just um, want to share my experience because uh, my feeling, my experience uh, show me that um, it's a context, the, the, the context of institution that deals with conflict resolution that has to grow together in a coherent way because what we, what we experienced in Florence, we have, uh, as this morning they were saying, we have 2,500 uh, mediation application uh, per e every year almost. And I think that uh, what made mediation so successful is that all the institutions that are relevant in the field grew up together. You know, the, the uh, Florence University started a, started a course on mediation and then they went to the court uh, talking with the judges and then the court <laughs> talked with the bar and then there was a relevant number of mediators that started uh, with, with uh, I would say, quite sophisticated uh, A deep knowledge. synergy, a deep yeah. synergy. So there was a synergy and the context, the environment grew up all together. So uh, they were skeptical. The, law, the external lawyers were mainly were the most skeptical. But then, you, you know, the only thing you can do is just show them that the tools might work. And then if they see it works, they come back. And they resist, and they started to resist less and less and less. And now they, they just come to mediation, they try it. If it works, they're willing to accept the result. If it doesn't work, they will try court. But, but you know, it's, it's working, it's growing. And I think that um, you have to try to develop all 
all the institutions together in the, in the culture of conflict resolution. It's very hard to just try, impose, to, try to develop mediation and mediators without uh, trying to explain it to the bar or to the lawyers. And, and so that's my point of view. If I cannot, can I can Please. Something? Maybe just but, by the way, just we were showing I'll interrupt, we were showing you how Florence responded compared with New York. Oh, okay. Just to show oh, you, wow. New, York, New York is where we have, you know, is financial capital, uh, really, of the world. And so you've got a very, I would say, a very sophisticated audience and an audience that is accustomed to very sophisticated lawyers and parties. So I thought it would just be interesting, as you would comment, to compare the results of two different cities to contrast Florence with a, with a place like New York. Oh, okay. Thank okay. you. Definitely. No, if I can comment something that is just confirming the, the vote of the parties, uh, it's, uh, as in-house lawyer, I would say that the change is starting from, from us, uh, in the sense that if we are not choosing yeah. this way a change, uh, it is difficult and can be proposed by the external lawyer, but it will be in a later stage. Uh, so I would say that we need to start from the beginning, because uh, we can choose even in the arbitration laws uh, to introduce a way, uh, a pres resolution. The difference between in-house lawyers and external yeah. lawyers is very significant. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> uh, if I, Any other? If I, if I may, I think the court Your, results are, are quite balanced here. Yeah. And I think this is not surprising because I think different stakeholders can influence the system in, in different ways. Uh, parties, are, of course, are the clients. If the clients are unsatisfied, they will go somewhere else. Uh, Adjudicators and external lawyers, uh, I mean, this is a market. If they want to stay in the market, they have to influence and improve it uh, by definition. So I, I think it's, uh, it's in different ways, but all stakeholders can, yeah, yeah. can have a, an impact. Yes. From your perspective, Colin, uh, would, you, would you like to add something about uh, the American reaction to, to that? Uh? Well, I do think that the culture around American dispute resolution is quite different than the culture around European dispute resolution. In the United States, we have great skepticism about public involvement at all. So whereas Europe welcomes public involvement, when you were saying before you think that dispute resolution could get a lot of credibility if the courts were actually referring the mediators, in the United States, that would not fly. Uh, the independence and the extrajudicial extra nature of dispute resolution is a big part of its appeal. So I think uh, there are big differences between the way that the two regions are working. And I, I would love to see that comparison, Mike, for so many of these questions to see how it plays out. I think you guys have the vision into everything, Singapore, uh, Europe, North America. It's gonna be fascinating to see all of that distilled. Uh, because I think that the lessons are not uniform. And a lot of the advice that we're distilling today would not fly in the United States. So we will be publishing all of this and making it available okay. on a comparable basis. It would be really useful. We hope that oh, academics. You can, yeah. Go into the app, you can get all the passports. Get all the passports. Okay. You can get everything now. The uh, one thing to mention maybe on technology is we're also looking at a number of different things in technology that are being looked at more and more, not just, but you know, maybe question for you, Connie, we're talking about here, the question is, is software going to decide everything? And much as I believe in using technology more and more, I am concerned about one thing. We know that technology, if, you know, we, if we look at the process of dispute resolution, there are three operating systems, if you'd like, involved, right? Mm -hmm. We have our rational cognitive one, and I have no doubt that software will outperform human beings on this. Mm -hmm. But we do have two other issues. We have an emotional operating system, which computers cannot understand. And we also have a social operating system that computers will have even greater difficulty understanding, which will tie into cultural acceptability and so on. So at the end of the day, the fear is a bit possibly what Isabel was mentioning. I look at Pictured Settled or some of the other technologies that I see coming into the dispute resolution field, and I see now people wanting to understand the algorithms behind it, and what they are now doing is they're playing their case and their strategy behind, once they understand the algorithms, they are now upping their game. Absolutely. And so what is happening now more and more is you are still getting something that is emotionally shaped and socially shaped in the name of cognition or rational systems. So. Do we ever expect and do you believe that actually artificial intelligence is going to get us to a level of conflict resolution where we're not going to have the cognitive outcomes, sure. but the emotional and social ones as well that will be accepted by human beings? 
Well, that's a very rich question, Jeremy. And uh, over the next few days, we're going to be having a conference in Paris focused the entire leadership of the online dispute resolution field is coming in. Uh, many people talk about artificial intelligence and the Uberization of the courts, the Uberization of self-driving cars and self-driving courts. Um, I would say uh, one of the things that's very interesting about technology, when I first started doing this work, everyone thought that technology was dehumanizing. A, they thought technology was only accessible to rich people. This is 20 years ago. And B, they thought that technology was only good for transactional disputes between buyers and sellers. But now what we see is people are resolving their divorces online. Because why is that happening? Because people are using technology in every area of their lives. Global business is happening through technology. This is how you, you use Facebook, you use Gmail, you use Gchat. This is the way our parties are living their lives more and more. And they are becoming comfortable dealing with emotional human things through technology. My son just broke up with his girlfriend. Yes. I didn't even know he had a girlfriend. They have never gotten together face to face. They have never had a date. They get on Skype every night and they chat for three hours. Now that may seem creepy, but the entire younger generation in the world is they are so fluent in these technologies. If you say to them, we have to get together face to face to resolve this, they will look at you like you have two heads. So we need to think not about the way we like to resolve our disputes. We need to think about the way the younger generation wants to resolve their yes. disputes. And if we're talking about the way dispute resolution is going to work in 10 years, we are doing ourselves a disservice to not be realistic about the changes that are happening. You already, you already replied to some of this uh, yeah. worrying because they, someone <clears throat> perceives technology use as a threat because as a threat for the humanization of justice. I think technology is just a tool. It depends on the way you use it. Exactly. It's everything and no one of us may be in favor of this humanization of justice because it will not work. <laughs> for the audience, yes. So, uh, to give uh, another, an answer to another question from the audience, uh, uh, yes, we will uh, have to go over. Uh, uh, not, the, not the written ones. Okay. Sorry, uh, hello, I didn't everybody. see you. I'm, I'm George, George Hannes from Belgium. I'm a, I'm a mediator in Belgium. I'd like to, if I may, to react on the two last points that have been touched upon. Um, the first one, you were referring to um, when you said uh, this will not um, this will not work in the United States. Uh, I think it it has worked in the United States, but we have evolved in the United States. Uh, the fact uh, I think in if you look at the in the United States, basically the two jurisdictions in which um, alternative dispute resolution and mediation, uh, in particular, have evolved the most. Uh, until now are Texas and Florida. I guess mm -hmm. you can agree. Mm -hmm. And over there, about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the judges uh, played a major role in prescribing and, um, well, sending peoples towards mediation. It would not work anymore now because it has come into the culture. But to get into the to get it into the culture, I think that the, the judges and the and the judicial system and, and as a whole has a big role to play, as it has played in the United States. Now, the second one is uh, where I'm much more uh, agreeing with you is, and also uh, Jeremy Lack pointed out, well, um, it's an emotional business and so on. I come from a, a business background, both uh, educationally as, as professionally. Now, I have sat in boards 20 years ago where people were saying it will never, never happen and it, no, it's, not, it's never going to happen and people will never buy whatever clothes and so on. And, and if you look at the questions on the, on the screen, a lot of them are, can be reduced to it's not going to happen. Or can we, we cannot make that happen, uh, computers taking over and so on. But as you refer to, um, I mean, um, computers are not, De technology is not dehumanizing anymore. It has, it is a way, it's, to, it's a tool also for emotions and so on. 
One of the things um, um, after the boardrooms I've sat in, sat in where people said uh, it's never going to happen, about 10 years ago, in education, which is, which, which is also a human business, of course, an emotional business, human business, a lot of people also said it's never going to happen. Look at how big blended learning is now. It's also working now, and that's a real human business, humanizing and so on. So I think we have to embrace it indeed. It's going to happen. <laughs> thank you. We will see. I think so. so I'll just thank you, Michel, and all the panelists uh, for this very interesting discussion that we have. Um, and uh, invite you to go back to, to your seats. And before I invite the final panel, if I could invite, uh, please, uh, Laura Benedetto to please come to the podium. Um, we realize that closing results should be at the very end of the day, but unfortunately, uh, Laura needs to leave us early, and so I just wanted to invite her up to say a few words at this stage, and also to take the opportunity to thank um, the Chamber of Commerce for all of its support and for making this whole event possible. So thank you very much, Laura, and the floor is yours. Eh, buonasera, eh, io sono Laura Benedetto, il segretario della Camera di Commercio di Firenze. Il mio intervento era previsto alla fine, ma devo anticiparlo per eh, motivi organizzativi. Io vi vorrei eh, intanto ringraziare mh, per la partecipazione e vorrei ringraziare tutti coloro che hanno partecipato, eh, soprattutto della Camera di Commercio, mi dispiace dirlo, ma sono stati veramente bravi <ride> i miei collaboratori, quindi eh, per l'impegno profuso, eh, tutti coloro che si sono iscritti, che hanno partecipato per dar vita a questo evento che veramente ci fa onore, fa onore a Firenze, fa onore alla Camera di Commercio, fa onore a tutti coloro che hanno partecipato. Eh, vorrei essere brevissima, vi do poi, eh, prego, prego, <ride> lascio la parola insomma, ai relatori, vi ringrazio veramente per essere qui e vi auguro un proseguo anche di weekend. Grazie. So we can go back to our schedule and knowing that we are back on track. So let me, uh, we now have our final session of the day. And if I could encourage you please, uh, please to remember to make your comments and questions throughout. It's really important for us, not only for the discussion today, but for afterwards when we collect our data, your questions and comments are also important for the global project. Um, that being said, let me now ask, uh, uh, so S Silvia is our moderator. And um, yes, <laughs> I don't know if you want to present your panelists or however you want to do this, then we can do the questions. I'll do the quick introductions then because we want to get on to the voting and then afterwards when we come back we can do it. So Silvia is a very uh, respected and, and extremely well-known uh, law and mediator here in Florence and we have as usual now a panel where we try and have representatives from every one of the stakeholder groups. We have uh, Alessandro who is with PwC, one of our uh, sponsors. Um, who is uh, an advisor uh, to parties in conflict. We have Maria, who uh, is uh, a vice president with a court here. And so uh, looking at the adjudicative provider side, we have Chiara, who is also on the provider side, uh, but I'd say more on the mediation side, the non-adjudicative services side. We've got Giovanni, who's an influencer at the University of, uh, um, of Siena. We've got Leonardo, who's a practicing uh, mediator, but also an owner of an uh, institution. Um, and we also have uh, Maria, who is uh, the representative of a user, the uh, user community. So thank you very much for all being here and for agreeing to participate in the session. Uh, Sylvia, with your permission, what I propose we do is let's do the questions, mm -hmm. and then you come back and we do that afterwards. Does that work mm -hmm. for you? Okay. Yes. So um, with that, let's go and do the questions for this session. And... Uh, so I invite you to go into the application again. You click on core questions. We do session four. You'll be asked the familiar questions about which stakeholder group you are in. 
So I'm just trying to clean up my screen a bit because it gets a bit confusing when we have too many things at the same time. Good. So we are core questions, session four. And I'll make it a bit bigger. So I'd vote this way. Okay, so the first question for session four is about responsibility. Who has the greatest responsibility for taking action to promote better access to justice in commercial dispute resolution? So who is most responsible to do something about the situation? Is it the adjudicative providers, the judges and arbitrators? Is it the external judges? Is it the governments and ministries of justice? Is it the in-house lawyers? Is it the non-adjudicative providers? Or is it the parties themselves, not their legal personnel, but the boards of directors, the CEOs, the C-suite executives, so to speak, um, or the owners of private businesses, shareholders, to be making, um, to be pushing for these changes and for action. So is anybody not ready for question two? Raise your hands so we can do question two. Question two is, what is the most effective way to improve parties' understanding of their options when it comes to resolving commercial disputes? So we're looking at improving parties' understanding. Is it by creating collaborative dispute resolution centers or hubs to promote awareness? Is it by education in business and law schools about all types of processes? Um, in other words, should arbitration mediation also be part of a business MBA course, for example, or in schools? Um, is it three procedural requirements for all legal personnel and parties to declare that they have considered non adjudicative processes before initiating arbitration or litigation? So you'd say, I have been informed of this and I am deliberately choosing to do litigation arbitration as one way of making sure that, um, that people are aware of their options. Um, is it four, providing access to experts to guide parties in selecting the most appropriate dispute process, the most appropriate process in each case? So for this one, we're talking about customized dispute resolution processes. And finally, is it, um, requiring parties to attempt non adjudicative processes first um, before they can do litigation arbitration. Okay, so those are the options that you have here. And again, please select three in your order of preference. Anybody not ready for question three? Okay. Question three, to promote better access to justice, where should policymakers and governments and administrators focus their attention? So should governments and um, public institutions focus their attention first on legislation or conventions for the recognition and enforcement of mediation settlements? Is it two? making non-adjudicative processes um, something compulsory or that parties can opt out of before litigation arbitration? Is it pre-dispute or early stage case evaluation or assessment systems that involve third party advisors who will not be involved in subsequent proceedings to be advising on process? Is it for reducing pressures on the courts to make them more efficient and accessible. So focusing on the courts and improving just the court systems. Uh, and five, is it the use of protocols, similar to what we had before, promoting non-adjudicative processes before adjudicative ones? So please select your three preferences again.
We seem to be going very quickly, so I hope everybody is voting. Um, anybody not ready for question four? All right, which of the following have the most significant impact on the future of policy making in commercial dispute resolution? So we're looking at future impact and on policy making. Is it going to be demand for certainty and enforceability of outcomes? Demand for increased efficiency, including through technology, number two. Is it demand for increased rights of appeal or oversight of providers? Is it for demand for transparency? Is it five, demand for increased uniformity and standardization? Or six, is it demand for processes that allow parties to represent themselves without lawyers? Or is it some other thing? So again, we're looking at future impact on public policy. And finally, and for your very last GPC core question, so please savor the moment, um, what innovations or trends are going to have the most significant influence on the future of commercial dispute resolutions? So what about trends in society, and what's gonna have the greatest influence on the future of commercial dispute resolution? Is it number one, change in corporate attitudes? Is it enhanced understanding of how people behave and resolve conflicts, for example, from brain and social sciences? Is it three, greater emphasis on collaborative instead of adversarial processes? Is it four, greater emphasis on personal well-being and stress reduction uh, of individuals or parties? Is it five, harmonization of international laws and standards? Or is it six, technological innovation that is gonna have the most significant impact on the future of commercial dispute resolution? With that, um, if the panel is ready, um, Sylvia, I invite you to go to the other room to prepare the answers. If you can join us back in 20 minutes, Bene. that would be great. That's Thank you very much. And now you're gonna have your final discussions in groups, and let's just look at what our questions are now for these discussion questions. And what we're truly really trying to get with these questions now is a sense of who can be doing what looking to the future. So if you'll go look at the discussion questions, section four. As usual, you're asked to put in your groups. But we're now looking at what you think are short-term, medium-term, and long-term changes that we should be focusing on. What are things that can and should be done in the one to five year is the short term, six to 10 years is the medium term, and more than 10 years is the long term. So happy discussions.